well, welcome everyone. Um, it's quite a, quite a few people here, so so thank you everyone for for coming, and um, and yeah, this 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 hopefully will be will be both interesting and and useful. Uh, for me, I, I I often often do things in compositing just because they're interesting, but it it really helps if they're actually use, useful too. So um, hopefully this one will be both, and um, and feel free to kind of uh, pop questions into the Q and A. Or into the chat, I'll try to try to keep an eye on it on my on my other screen. So, so if I if it feels over every now and again, someone not keeping eye contact with you is because I'm checking the screen. So, so yeah, uh, let's uh, let's let's look at this. So, I'm gonna share my screen. Press this button, and this button here, and just check it on my other screen that everything is working. It looks all cool. So groovy. So. This is um this is a talk that or a little tutorial that I did for for um, the before and afters magazine uh, in in December and um, if you want I can drop this link into the into the chat as well actually see if I can do that and if that will be easy um, yeah. I'm struggling with it more than I thought um, where are my meeting controls up here here they are. Uh, Q and A and chat. So I'll just I'll just drop drop them in here as well in case in case anyone wants to wants to check out that that uh, that tutorial. Um, but uh, but basically, what we are going to look at today is this uh, concept of spatial frequencies and um, and how they could be could be helpful for compositing and uh, what does it mean. And um, and um, I will show you a few things that um, I didn't show in this this particular tutorial in here. So so there will be some some additional things that we that I, that I didn't didn't cover in this. Um, but anyways, we'll get uh, straight straight on to it. Just check in the chat as well. Yeah, keeping other windows open in my in my other screen. Q. Cool. So. Um, Many many years ago, uh, this guy is called um, Adelson, and his friends, um, they Adelson and Anderson, they 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 wrote this paper um, about um, using image pyramids, and um, and the idea is that um, if you scale an image down, uh, if you make an image smaller and smaller and smaller and smaller, then basically Every time you do this, you are losing some details. Um, so, so if you were to then scale it back up, you would see this image becomes kind of you know softer and softer and softer, and as as you're, as you're losing detail. But um, but what they thought is what would be interesting is if you looked at the differences between those images uh, that you're scaling down and saw what's what's actually left over. And um, and uh, what this gives you is um, the details that were lost at every single stage when we when we did the scaling. And then what we can actually do with those data is we can actually start applying them to our images uh, for different purposes. So a few years ago, I, I read this paper and tried to build it myself. Um, and um, there are tons of um, other tools already being built in Wikipedia as well, which I will show you in a bit. Um, but let's let's kind of go, go through this, through the kind of principles of this, and what what do we mean when we talk about images and uh, and, and and frequencies and and such. So, if you have a picture, uh, and I've got the same same picture of my past student here, um, looking gloomy um, or intense. Either way, um, and um, and um, if you think of a every line in this image as some kind of a signal, uh, some kind of a wave. So, for example, if I wanted to illustrate this, if I just took one of these lines and I just crop out, let's say, this line from here. Uh, let's let's do this this tracking mark. I just just crop out just this one line. Okay, and um, and then I stretch it out across the image. 
then um, and we, if you just look at this brightness of this and if we imagine that um, that uh, where it is darker it is further away from us where it is brighter it is let's say closer to us we could imagine that this is some kind of a curved curved surface so moving my um, controls for zoom aside for the moment you can't see them but i can see them there's uh, there's, there's some controls on my screen um, and anyways so if you go to look at this wave and this this sort of the the top view of this wave if you just view inside of nuke this tool called waveform monitor let's look at that then we can kind of see what this wave might might sort of look like is um, you know there's there's area in here which is a little bit brighter and then it is relatively smooth but not perfectly smooth you can see it's kind of noisy then we have sort of more detail and some other detail and again relatively smooth but not as smooth as this area over here and then again more details and then another kind of brighter area in there so you can think of this now as like every image is actually a combination of these loads of loads of loads of waves um there's another theory um from a french mathematician called fourier uh, from uh, at least two centuries ago that you can then decompose all signals into kind of individual waves um which is an interesting theory to follow uh, in a different lesson but um but from our purposes this is kind of you know good enough and um and then what we might want to do is um, apply another concept on top of this, which is called filtering. So filtering in the simplest form is uh, called blurring. So how blurring works or filtering is that you take some pixels nearby and you add them together and you get the average value and you put that in the middle. So if I do this over here, because these pixels are kind of similar to each other already, the average value will be the same. Whereas over here, because some pixels are kind of really bright, some pixels are dark, if I average them together, they will all kind of be gray. So if I actually do it, and, and then basically what matters as well is, is how big is this area that I'm averaging over? So the more values I average together, the more average the result will be. Um, so let's look at this. If I do a blur, and I use a classic, Gaussian blur in the given case. Um, and if I make my image smoother, you can see that the sig signal becomes smoother as well. What's actually happening here is um, I'm using a 60 pixel white kernel. Um, so it is um, roughly, roughly this big actually. So about 120 either side. So it's about this big. And it's averaging all the values together in this in this region in here, and then it puts that to the to the average value for that. And you can see because um, I have some you know bright and dark values in here, but overall it's kind of bright. I kind of I'm kind of left with this bright value. Um, if this kernel was bigger, so if I included more from the sides, I would imagine that overall this middle part in here, which used to be bright, that would then become darker. So if I if I make this bigger, you can see that. Uh, eventually everything becomes kind of more even more gray okay very fascinating so but the important thing is that we can think of images as um, as waves because what's happening underneath is we have pixels of different values and uh, when i average those pixels together bigger and bigger areas of these pixels together the the value just you know they average out and, and the signal becomes smoother so with this signal processing theory if you apply to two dimensions then um, i'm averaging these pixels in both directions and again this is just blurring this is nothing new to anyone who's using nuke or any other software so if you just blur things my image becomes softer happy days wow a softer looking image and um, just to illustrate this with another tool this is the slice tool from uh, Nukipedia, which gives you a slice over 
over you know your cert chosen range so for example if over here i have this 0.1 and 0.2 uh, where i put them it, it, it kind of samples this area on this line between them so you can see i have some darker values then some brighter values and then some darker in the end again so darker values brighter values brighter values so that's 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 the values on the on this line over here and again if i if i blur this a little bit you can see the signal becomes smoother and less smooth so so how is that helpful excellent question um so what we can do by doing these techniques is we can do what uh, Anderson and um, and Adelson did in, in their paper as well. Is we can look at what actually happens between the stages. So Anderson and Adelson, what they did is they made the image smaller and smaller and smaller instead of blurring it. And you could do that. Um, but blurring also, also works relatively well. Uh, and it's easier. So if I blur this image, by a certain amount, like let's say that much. You can see the image has become smoother and I've lost a lot of the details from the skin. So before and after, I'm just kind of checking how much how much of this is actually visible through, through Zoom at the moment as well. So I'll blur it a little bit more. So before and after. So image becomes smoother, had lots of details, now it is smoother. Let's look at some other region in here as well. So for example, if I look at this dot, we can see overall relatively smooth region, relatively uniform color uh, with some noise and details. And then there's this darker bit. So that's the darker bit, that's the, that's the dot over there. And then again, relatively smooth area after that. If I blur this, then eventually, I, can, I might be able to blur this so much that this um, this dot might actually more or less kind of average out and kind of almost disappear completely. But I still have some information in here. I still have more general uh, brightness information and, and this is in these lower frequencies. So what you can do, similar to what Adelson and Adelson did, Anderson and Adelson, is look at what's the difference between those images. So what is the difference between this? So if I look at this image and I take this value from the original, I take the average value from the original, what I'm now going to get is values that go below and above zero. You can't see them mostly because they go kind of tend to go below zero then they're very, very small. But if I gain up a little bit, then you can see they're, they're actually there. The other way of visualizing this is if you just add a little bit to this, like 0 0.5 or something like that, then um, then you can also see this. This is this is the detail that we have taken out. So the values that went um, went below this skin color there. So this is the values that we've taken out. And um, and the interesting thing is that now because I've taken them out, I can simply put them back as well. So in here I do a from, I do a minus. So whatever this value is, uh, I take it from whatever the original value was and we'll see what the difference is. Because the original values often were smaller than these averaged values, then, um, then we get some negative values as the result. But if I put them back with the plus, I can get back the original result. So, Yay, we have managed to achieve nothing. Absolutely no difference between the original image and the new one. So why is that any good? Because originally we had our image in a single pipe, but now we actually have our image in this in these two pipes in here. We have the image as low frequency detail, the blur image, and I have the difference between the blur image and the original image. And that means I can edit those images separately without affecting each other. So for example, if I was to do a quick clone paint job in here, it's very difficult for me to look at. So I'll just look at my final result that I would normally look over here. 
And if I just did something, let me say a clone paint from here to here, maybe from here to here. And I just do that. Looks relatively okay. Not the best job, but it's okay. And um, this is what I was actually painting. I was painting some of these details from here to here. So I paint some of those details from here to here. I'm painting this kind of skin texture from one place to another. And um, by separating it out in this fashion, I didn't do any paint work on this softer, blurrier image. And this is important because if I had done it on both of them, if I had just painted my original image, I could have again subtle changes in the zoom. But what you get by doing this is you're actually copying across some of the um, values of the darkness of the overall image um, that are stored in these lower frequencies. So in general, this frequency separation allows you to separate the texture of objects kind of from the lighting of them. It doesn't work fully, but, uh, but that's the underlying sort of uh, value of it. So for example, if I look over here, and if we do a, another blur and the from, let's do a blur and merge and the from. And actually start blurring, so we'll actually get some output. You can see this is the texture that we are removing from this image. And this is this is the softer softer looking image without this texture. So it becomes softer before, after, before, after. So for example, if I if I blur it enough to to remove some of this um, so that I don't see um, the the mustache starting to grow. So just enough like that. And then I, again, extract this texture. I, I look at this and this is the skin texture now. So that's the texture of the screen separated from, from, the, from the lighting of the skin. So you can think of this in this way is that this contains now the lighting and the color, and this contains the pure texture, the, all the wrinkles and that, that's aspect of the skin. So if I then wanted to put them back together, I can just with another merge and the plus inside. So I plus them back together. I arrive at my original result. Again, no difference. So seems like pointless, but it isn't because what we have done is we have again turned one single image into two separate streams of the same image. So we have a low frequency stream that contains the color and the lighting and the high frequency stream that contains the texture. So if I paint this texture and just the texture, again, we can get hopefully relatively realistic looking results without um, accidentally copying across any shadows. So if I do the same paint, but just on the original image, you can see we have painted a lot of this redness from up there to down here as well. So this patch up here used to be red. So by doing this clone painting like that from there to there, we have actually painted across the, the red color as well. But if you separate your image by blurring it into, this is the color and the lighting, and this is just the details, we can now paint the details on the own. So this is cool. Okay, and um, and there are lots of lots of um, tools that allow you to actually do that in um, in Silhouette. Um, this is now built into into Silhouette as well. Um, in Photoshop, it's called high pass filtering. Um, there's there's a 
bunch of gizmos on Wikipedia that allow you to separate these gizmos. But underneath, what's actually happening is they're, they're doing a, a blur and a from. Q. Cool. Now, just to show you, this blur and the from itself as a concept is, um, is something that um, already exists inside of Nuke and in some other softwares as well. So you can think of this as here, it's only the low frequencies that pass. I can drop another slice tool in here. Let's do another slice tool. So let me draw a slice over this area here. So in this area, we are letting only low frequencies pass. Just putting it right across this dot over there as well. Whereas in this area, we are letting only the very high frequencies pass. That's the difference between these, these low frequencies and the original image. In the original image, we have both. We have the low frequencies and the high frequencies. So this is the low frequencies, this is the high frequencies. Sorry, this is the low frequencies, this is the low and high frequencies. And this is just the high frequencies. So the high frequencies are there going above and below zero, containing just the detailed information. Where is the skin? darker or brighter than the, or like the wrinkles darker and brighter than the overall skin. If you wanted to make your image look sharper, then um, when you put this image back together, what you can do is you can amplify these high frequencies. You could make them stronger and that will make the image look sharper. You still have the same amount of low frequencies, the, the brightness and darkness of the image wouldn't change. But if, if you wanted to amplify this detail, you could make your image look sharper. So when we put this image back together, let's do a, another multiply in here. So another um, merge, let's do a plus. So again, we, we, we reach back our original image. So you can see it's the original image, no difference there. But if, we plus it one more time. If we do it one more time, we add this image one more time to itself. So we add the high frequencies to it again. So we take these high frequencies, this detail here, these values, and add them to itself. Keeping everything connected. What you'll get is a sharpening effect. Again, let's see here. Probably not a lot of this comes through Zoom because you're getting compression on top of this, but we're getting some artifacts in here. We're getting this darkening around the edges, but these are levels of details here. They are now looking sharper. So you can see we can sharpen our image. And basically what we're doing is if you look at the slice tool again, is the small details in here. We make the small details more prominent simply by adding them on twice. It's like I have the original small details and then I add them on again and I have the small details are now twice as strong. And this is exactly the effect that the sharpen node in Nuke does. So if you use the sharpen node, you will get exactly the same effect. If we were to use the same size as well, let's do nine. So identical, okay? So what's happening here is that we as humans, we do it in our eyes as well. We kind of look at, we consider edges to be more, you know, more important than the, than the, the overall smoothness of objects, uh, just because we get more details out of this, more information. So our eyes tend to amplify this detail as well. So when we when we amplify it artificially in the images, then that makes makes our image, you know, images look sharper. Cool. 
So just another kind of fun thing to do with, with this tool. Okay, so simply once you've extracted your high frequencies, if you add them on again, you get a sharpened looking image. Right, so this kind of covers sort of more most of the theory that we uh, and a little bit more than um, than than what we what I discussed in this uh, article um, for that magazine. Um, so we we take the signals and we and we add them together. But I'd like to show you a few more practical examples of this. So let's look at this in the block wall. It's depending on how we do with do with time. I'll, I'll build some of it to, to show you how it works, and then I'll show you the show you the already built version. So another node inside Nuke uh, called Laplacian is a fancy sounding name for something that we have already seen. So Laplacian is a blur and a from. So Laplacian gives you the output of if you were to blur an image by this amount and then take it from the original, what would be left over? Um, just to prove it to you. Here is my image and I do blur by let's say 20, nice and soft. And we do a from, merge and from, and we get this result. And if I was to do a Laplacian, with a size of 20, we will get exactly the same result. So Laplacian, basically, that's the detail that's left over when we blur an image. So it's just a quick way to get this thing. But underneath, what it is actually doing is it's blurring an image and it's taking it from the original image. So in a similar fashion, because this contains the details of the image, if I was to remove these details from the image, I would be left. So if I add them to the image, I'm getting a sharpening effect. Whereas if I take them from the image, I'm getting a blur blurring effect. So Laplacian and the from is basically a very convoluted way to do a blur. If you do a blur and the from, you're doing a Laplacian. If you're doing a Laplacian and the from, you're doing a blur. So they're the same effect. It's just this might look, look fancier and more clever in your script until you, you know, show it to people who actually understand that it's the same thing. So you can do it with a blur and the from, it doesn't matter. So I'm going to replace it here as well. We'll do it with a blur and the from. So let's do a blur. And um, for this shot, um, we might want to kind of replace this sign from the wall. So we have somehow stabilized our image. Um, so we've got our, our image uh, nicely stabilized. I'm going to drag my zoom controls around a bit. Um, so image is nicely stabilized, but what you should see is that um, there is some lighting lighting changes happening in here. But uh, effectively, what I would kind of like to do is, in order to get rid of this this um, patch on the wall, I want to take some of this wall from underneath over there. Now let's see what would happen if I just tried to do that. So if I just go uh, somewhere here, find my frame, and if I just took those those um, those things from down there, and let's do nothing. So just try to take these bricks and move them up there. Should work, right? You know, it's it's just just a very basic lamp. I just want to take those bricks and move them up there. So I can try doing that. I can take them and start moving them further up. But as I move them further up, it feels like they keep getting darker and darker and darker. And that's really annoying. By the time they get up there, it's like, wow, that's really, really dark. They they did, they definitely did not look that dark when they were down there. So I moved them down there. It's like, uh, no, okay, yeah, no, no, they're not really that dark. So so why are they getting so dark when they get up there? Um, and you know they, they're not because it's really the the color itself hasn't changed. I'm just moving it up and down. It's just compared to the background, this general area 
this patch is actually it actually is that much darker. It's it's just that our eyes um, compensate for this small gradient difference, so we don't see the darkness difference. But if I actually move it up, it's like oh my god, it's it's almost darker. Yeah, like, uh, it's it's so hard to believe if if I, if I wasn't doing it myself. So what's happening there is um, it's this color constancy effect, where um, if you have something uh, over a bright background, it looks darker. Whereas if it is over a a bright uh, you know dark background, then it looks brighter. And 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 this patch itself is not changing color. This 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 um, this gray ball is 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 exactly the same same value of gray. So if I zoom into it, it's, it's like it's that color, 0 0.3. If I move it over here, it's still exactly the same color, 0 0.3. It's still the same amount of gray. It's just um, just depending on what's behind it, it looks like it's it's really dark. But no, it's not. It's, it's just, just normal gray, it's 0 0.3. Um, so, whereas, you know, that's... That, that the, if you move it over there, it suddenly, suddenly, suddenly feels feels like it's really bright. So, so yeah. So what what can we do in order to be able to to still kind of quickly quickly paint this out and uh, and move these things things up there? Um, this only works on on this particular frame in here because it's not stabilized. But yeah, if I wanted to just put this thing over here and get it to work, surely this this should be easier. So. What we need to kind of consider there is that we we might need to break this image then again into the details and into the lighting effect. So how do we do this? Well, basically we can look at this image and be thinking about what is it that we have to recreate. So if I, let's say I gain down a little bit so make it a bit more visible for you guys. You can see there is there is um, the, the, the cinder block uh, bricks and the, like like the, their edges. So that's actually what I want to kind of recreate. And another thing that I want to recreate is this kind of general smoothness of this of this lightning lighting going across the screen. So if I blur my image just enough that uh, I don't need to blur it is so much that this thing disappears. Although that's usually a good approach. If you're doing some kind of a, a marker removal, so if you're doing a marker removal, and um, like in this guy in here, if you simply blur it enough that the marker itself disappears, then you've separated where the marker is and where is the lighting effect of the skin. So if I do this, you can see that the marker is in this in these details in here, and the lighting and color effect is in here. So I only need to. So I, as long as I don't touch this color and texture effect, then I'm fine to just work with this texture effect in here and just paint that. So as long as I paint only this, paint some texture in here. I should be okay. Again, if you were to compare this with, if I was to paint from here to there, it's like if I have the circles over, you know, then it looks like it's you know it's, it's the same color inside of the circles, but then you take 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 it away. It's like wow, it's it this this thing is so much darker. Than the surrounding areas, like I, I don't believe that it is that much darker until I actually put it over there. So, um, whereas here it's like you know, if I blur it enough that this marker itself disappears from my lighting and color information, then it is extracted only to this detail information. So if I just fix the details, I will have fixed my fixed my whole image as long as I don't touch my color. Now, that's a good approach. But sometimes the element that you want to remove is huge. Like in this case, it's, it's, it's massive. So when you think about cleanup, you actually have to think about not what we are trying to remove, but what we are trying to recreate. So what I'm trying to recreate in this case is the wall and, uh, and, uh, and the thin lines on that wall. 
So if I blur my image until those thin lines disappear, then it means I have somewhere extracted, I can somehow extract those thin lines and, uh, and keep them separate. So over here, if I don't now do a merge in the from, you can see in here, I have extracted the texture of the wall, the lines without the lighting. So this means over here, I can now do some quick uh, paintwork. Maybe I'll just do a, a similar kind of roto shape that I did earlier over here. Just take the exact same one. Uh, I actually can't take, use the exact same one because it's broken. Because that one wasn't done on a stable image. But if I just try to kind of roughly follow these edges in here, it's always a good habit to to try to follow edges in that you already have in your image. And maybe if I just take a whole bunch like that. And let's hope this is enough. Something like this. Q. And um, we quickly pre-mult to take this patch. Give it a bit of corner pin to help with any fine, fine adjustments of perspective. Just put these to, to where I want them. And, um, and we just merge this over its original image in here. And I'm just going to move them higher. So in this in this high frequency image, I'm just going to take it up there and try to try to cover my old old image that I had up there as much as I can. I might need a slightly bigger patch, I think, over there. But I'm just going to adjust it to place. Just so that these these lines would more or less line up with uh, existing lines on the on the wall. And I'm just going to make this, this shape itself bigger to include a little bit more. Something like that. So I've taken this patch from down there and moved it up there. But obviously, if I now I have fixed the kind of the, the high frequency details. This is the this is the small details. But if I put them back to the original image, like we did in last time. If I don't touch the blurry version, if I just, just add it to the original, and let's do a uh, plus, then it doesn't work. It's because you know I still have the, the old image, you know, the, the old the blurry version still contains um, the sign that I want to remove, at least some of it. It could it's it's here in this high frequencies, but it's also here in the low frequencies. So if you can blur it enough so it actually disappears, great. So, which is why good VFX um, supervisors, when they're on set, try to make tracking markers that are small because tracking markers that are small can be nicely blurred out. So, in this case, we we don't have to treat this blurry image. But in in a case like this, it is there in the high frequency, but it's also there in the low frequency. It's there in the you know blurry image too. So, what you just need to do is you just need to make sure that you 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 clean this as well. Um, luckily, because this is a blurry image, I can be quite um, careless uh, when painting this out. So I can paint this um, with fairly uh, big brush strokes. I'll still try to do some low opacity on this, and I'll try to make it happen on all frames. So I'll just quickly try to start you know painting this out adding some general color from its surroundings onto it and i don't mind if my result here is a little bit blurry because this is the blurry version of the image it's already blurry i don't mind losing some some you know detail in here because it's it's fine so i just want to kind of remove this thing from the middle Soften, 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 soften. 
you can sing a softening song while you're, while you're doing this, if you have one. I I do like annoying my students with my with my paint songs every now and again. Paint, 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 paint. So just keep painting until until this area is nice and smooth and and we don't have what looked like the the unevenness that we had earlier. So just try to remove a little bit more of that. Okay. And this might just be enough for me for now. Kind of kind of happy with that. Getting some brighter color in there. And then I will just also soften it because it's already soft anyway. I'll soften it a lot. This should also happen on all frames. I just blur it. So I'm hoping to get kind of a fairly, fairly even, even gradient of, out of this. Okay, something like this. So, and you could you could, you could even do, even do switches. Just just take the, take the whole area and just just blur it a little bit more. Um, but then mask mask blur only to 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 one one area in here. So I just want to kind of blur that area in there. Okay. So now if I add these details onto it, I'm getting a wall without the bad, you know, the, the sign underneath. And this this is giving me the details of the wall. So I can just kind of compare if I had done this paintwork just on its own. So if I just take that paint and uh, you know what, what we did earlier is if I just take this patch and I move it up there, that's what it will look like. And um, it's crazy. It it looks it looks so so different and so bad. Whereas if I if I move it like that, then you know it's the same texture. But we, we treated the the the, um, the smooth area separately as well, and um, so this is, you know this here contains the texture and the original lighting from underneath this gradient from there, and it doesn't work at all. It doesn't match at all. Here it still contains the same textures, the same details, but uh, the smooth area, the lighting, we have painted out ourselves, and it's a totally totally separate uh, separate looking image, and it's it's so much more better quality. So in the end, you just kind of need to make sure that you, you capture just the part that you actually need to put on top of your image. And um, you should have a reasonable result. Not going to cache all of it, but maybe just enough to to show that after stabilizing and unstabilizing, you get back to your original image. So here I'm I'm not showing how I did the tracking for this, um, or how I did the stabilizing and unstabilizing, but um, but uh, what we are looking at is that this technique works. And allows us to to extract these high frequency details from the low frequency details and treat them separately. Mm -hmm. Let's see if this plays back. Seems okay. I can still see a little bit of a shadow in the of what used to be the the um, the sign, but then again. Normally, comp takes, takes at least half a day. This was just ten minutes. So, for a ten-minute job, I think this is this is okay compared to this job over here, which is not okay. So, you can clearly see there's a difference to these two techniques. Cool. So, yes. So Anderson and um, Adelson they did not sort of fully show show those ideas. They, they did kind of um, try 
extracting different techniques and um, you know these different different frequencies on different levels and um, and combining them um, in kind of more automatic ways in order to yeah extract details that you can see a little bit more in some images than in others. One thing that they did try, which was interesting, is um, rather than uh, blending together two images very softly or with a very hard edge, they thought like, what if um, you could blend images um, with a hard edge where there's texture, but soft edge for the lighting, um, but they also say that actually it doesn't quite work that well. Um, it only works if these images line up really, really well. So I tried this as well. So first of all, this is their concept of how you could um, separate images into these smaller frequencies if you just were to scale an image. So if you just make an image, uh, you just make an image uh, smaller and smaller and smaller and smaller then uh, and and try to find the differences in in every single step um then then it's it is possible to do that yes you can get the differences in every step as well to get the details in every single level um and this is then if you if you did it as as this whole kind of pyramid um and uh, you can try to combine this you know trick that they said which is that um rather than combining things with you know just a hard edge and uh, or a very very soft edge you you combine it on sort of multiple levels you start with um a little bit of softness a little bit of hardness a little bit of and you and you keep keep adding to it until until hopefully you will get something that uh, has a smoother transition um so it's like it's hard transition where it is a hard edge and the smooth transition where it is smooth edge uh, doesn't quite work um Although built upon this uh, idea is Photoshop's uh, healing brush, um, except the difference is that um, the healing brush also looks at um, you know the, the the shape in here that we need for the for the hard edges is is a very you know it, it has no relevance to the actual texture that's happening underneath the image, um, so. But um, but you know it exists. So so they said this this exists, and I tried it, and they said it didn't work, and I said and, you know, I, I tried it, and this I agree with them. It doesn't quite work. Um, but in my um, the conclusion of my sort of uh, talk in here where, and my tutorial, I sort of said there's um, there's also potential other techniques that you could use. Um, which uh, soften your image better than just doing a Gaussian softening. And, um, and what do I mean by that? So and this is something that I, I, I occasionally come, come across in, in some of the jobs as well. And this is a technique that some of my past students who are working on, on a film now, um, they were using on, on that film and uh, that actually worked, worked quite well for them. So this blurring and finding the difference technique kind of works if your images um, is, or like what you're trying to remove is, is quite separate from its background. So if this, this dot that I'm trying to remove from here um, is, uh, is on a fairly even background, then, um, then I can blur it until, until this dot you know, more or less disappears. But um, in other areas, like if I wanted to remove this um, this mustache, then over here again, I could I could blur this until until um, until it's you know it disappears, and then then effectively I have extracted it into this other area. But um, but this might get get a little bit risky. When we get to the edge of the nose, for example. So where you have the edge of the nose, you can see that we're blurring the edge of the nose as well. So if I'm going to try some treatments on this, and um, and I try to do some paintwork 
in those areas in here. So I'm just going to, again, separate it into my detail information and into my um, lighting and color information. And then I will put them back together. Let's put them back together. So if I put them back together, you can see um, it, lo it looks all good. But then if I try to do some paintwork in here, um, I can try to you know, copy this texture from here to here. And that seems to work. And from here to here as well, that, that seems to work. Um, that's all fine here too, copying the skin texture under there. But if I get too close to the nose, what you see is that it, you know, we are actually blurring the nose because what's actually happening in here is that um, I'm copying across uh, potentially some texture where there is meant to be this sharp edge. There is meant to be a sharp edge that tells me that this is the, where the nose ends and where this um, lip begins. So again, if I, if I try to do some paintwork in here, just do that. Um, that's working for the for the skin, but uh, but when I get too close to the nose, you know that that's going to what what's happening underneath is that uh, I'm actually painting painting over this uh, where I, I needed to have the detail of the nose, so I, I I don't want to remove that detail of the nose because what I'm you know basically doing here is I'm saying that's just a normal lip texture, but now I'm painting over this, so this is the kind of final thing that I wanted to show you. And uh, this comes from another uh, great book by this guy called Zeliski, um, Richard. And um, it's called Computer Vision Algorithms and Applications. And this guy very generously has made the online version of this book uh, free, free to the world. So you can, um, you can find it on his website. There's an online version of his book. Uh, normally costs uh, 50 or 60 pounds or something because it's a proper 1,000 page textbook. And one thing that he describes, um, and you know, it's not just him, I just found a good illustration in his book, um, is um, something from Durand and Torsi. It's called bilateral filtering. And uh, the idea is that you only filter when your pixels are already similar. So I only filter colors that are similar to each other. And when there's a sharp boundary, then I don't blur across the sharp boundary. This is uh, expensive because um, this means that every pixel is getting a slightly different amount of blurring. So it's only in the very recent versions of Nuke where um, this became available because you need a GPU to, to use that uh, technique. But there is a bilateral filter node. So let's do a bilateral. And the way that the bilateral filter works is, um, is it's still a blur node. You're just blurring things. Um, and it, it initially it seems to do nothing. But uh, what you're kind of telling is that let's blur across a certain visible range or a certain range in distance, but not across a certain range in, in color difference. So here, I can kind of choose make the color difference small uh, and say that it's only these similar colors because this uh, you know dark stubble there is, is similar to the dark uh, skin nearby, but this difference nearby is big. So this is a you know dark area and that's a bright area pixels within this dark area, they're similar to each other. So what you're actually doing is you're saying, when there's a big difference, then, then let's, let's not, uh, in, in colors, then let's not paint across that big difference. So, so this actually helps you to preserve the edge. Um, so when you do your same paintwork, like we did last time, and you can still extract the details from this. So if I do now do the same from and plus, so if I do a from, what I'm now getting is effectively the kind of pure skin details and much less of the nose left in there. 
so the nose edge is is is, is like it's it's it, we're not blurring across that so we're not losing this this detail in this end and not extracting it so if i paint over this with exactly the same paint that i had earlier you can see one of them affects the nose and the other one doesn't let's view them with a with a wipe so we have blurry nose and nose where the sharpness has been preserved because the bilateral filter has never blurred across the edge so when i was painting my high frequencies i was never painting anything into that area because there was there was never anything there so so this this edge is already in this image in the, in the kind of blur image so i haven't taken out this edge from a blur image it's whereas if i do the usual gaussian blur then gaussian blur blurs across that edge if i use a bilateral filter bilateral filter says that okay this is a relatively even area so what i'm going to do is i'm going to say that when there is only you know when there's a sharp difference in colors then uh, then stop blurring if there isn't a difference then then continue to blur within um so any differences smaller than that we will continue to blur any differences bigger than that we will not blur across that edge and the positional um, sigma that just tells us kind of how much do we blur in those areas so it's a nice tool if you wanted to build your own um, degrain tools and stuff like that as well that might preserve hair detail and stuff um, can be can be very helpful so this was the last tip that I wanted to kind of give to people if building these things is um, I mean now you should see that building these things is easy you blur and the from and the blur and the plus that's it or if you want to take it more advanced bilateral blur and from and bilateral blur and plus but only do this if you really need to because it's a heavy node that needs a good GPU but these tools are already uh, available many people have put them together um, for example, there's a frequency separator inside Wikipedia. There's a standard deviation frequency separation. There is um, a sharpening tool, um, which actually is uh, sharpening multiple, um, again, levels, high, medium, low, ultra low, effectively just describing the size of the frequency. And there's Wavelet, which is quite nice. Um, uh, from Mats Hagbartland, which is the starting of a um, bilateral filter. So he he built this one before the one in Nuke came out, um, which is nice. And also uh, one of Escape Spa students, um, uh, Attila, um, was my studio assistant for a while as well. He put together a nice tool that effectively underneath is allowing you to, to do a um, transform masked kind of, but uh, but only for the for the frequencies keeping the colors separate so so again you can kind of uh, do things like wrinkle removal just re you know putting some skin texture from here to here but not changing the color so the color remains as it as it was so so a lot of these these tools are available and what i would like to conclude with is uh, just this shot in here just because it's fun um so now that you've you've seen how how these kind of different techniques work, you can go put them together for artistic effects. So where it says escape um, in high frequencies, it might say accept in low frequencies. Escape in high frequencies. Accept in low frequencies. Magical. Um, so now you know. The techniques that we kind of um, saw in this nice webinar you can try playing with putting images like like this together yourself there's there's other ones in the internet that uh, have like marilyn monroe and uh, albert einstein when you look at it close enough it's albert einstein if you if you look if you're further further away it's marilyn monroe so now you know how how these things work so i will conclude with that